This is CBC Here and Now. We will not tolerate racism and xenophobia in our community. Memorial University trying to get ahead, get ahead of any coronavirus related racism before it actually happens. It's a snowmobiler's paradise this season. All the snow is not only fun for riders, but also great for business. We start tonight with the coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. China has seen a reduction in cases since the outbreak, but some other countries have seen an increase in infections. Those details are just ahead, but first, as the virus spreads, so do incidents of racism. The administration at Memorial University is trying to get ahead of any incidents here before they happen. And that includes a statement issued last week from the university's president. Here now's Terry Roberts reports. We want people to think before they talk. The dean of graduate students says this is what prompted the president's statement. We are getting a, a few complaints, not from uh, Chinese students themselves, but from their classmates and lab mates who have witnessed other students or other lab mates making uh, what they thought were funny remarks or uh, remarks calling it uh, uh, the China virus or um, making jokes about uh, having to use hand sanitizers and things like that. In a word, ignorance. Observers were actually uncomfortable with the, this sort of behavior and really felt that uh, the university should make a public statement to say that people should be aware of the things that they're saying and how hurtful it can be. But this master's student from China has not encountered any problems. Everyone around me, uh, my, uh, my friends, they all respect me. They may have some questions about the virus, but uh, they asked respectfully. Though his friends in Vancouver have not been so lucky. When they do shopping in the grocery uh, store, when they were wearing masks, people trying to get away from them. So Fang says he appreciates the president's message. It minimizes the tension uh, and uh, some misunderstanding uh, of the international students. There have been numerous incidents in North America and beyond of people of Asian descent being harassed or attacked because of erroneous coronavirus fears. And in a statement on the university's news site last week, President Gary Kachinowski said some members of the Mon community have been singled out and felt ostracized and mistreated by others. He said racism and xenophobia will not be tolerated. It was a message repeated today by Supranet. We've been hearing about it in the media in other places around the world, and so we just wanted to get ahead of it before it started to get any worse. Jason Fang urged people to educate themselves and is confident the virus can be contained. We as Chinese, we are optimistic uh, uh, about it, and we think we can fight the virus. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. As I mentioned a moment ago, there's been a slight reduction in the number of coronavirus cases in China, but there has been a jump in infections in three countries over the weekend in other parts of the world. Italy is one of those countries, the hot spot for the virus in Europe. It now has more than 150 cases. In about 25 minutes, we'll get the latest on the virus and its global impact. Well, we now know when we're going to have a new premier. The Liberal Party now says May 9th is the date that it's going to choose somebody to replace Dwight Ball. But there's criticism over the rules which will allow campaigns to keep their donors' identities secret. Here now is Peter Cowan is with me now. So, Peter, give us a sense of just what these rules are. Well, Anthony, we're looking at a very tight timeline. Anyone who's considering a run has just 11 days to put their nomination in and pay a chunk of the $25,000 entry fee. The party says that's enough time for leadership candidates to get their affairs in order and scrounge up the cash. They insist a quick leadership race makes it easier on candidates who are putting their lives on hold. But what's noticeable in the rules for this race is what's not there. No spending limits, no donation limits, no requirements to disclose your donors. Um, you know, we would, um, we would ask that the candidates um, consider at the end of uh, their campaign when they get their audits done that uh, they be um, open and, uh, and make, make that available. Now, these rules will benefit wealthy people who can spend their own money. If you look at the last race, Dwight Ball spent $200,000 of his own money in order to win. Nothing changes this time, and now the prize is bigger. It's the Premier's office, and it didn't take long for the PCs to blast these rules. We'll never know whether favors 
were purchased and granted because there's no disclosure of the identity of people or entities that are giving the money. In this day and age, if you look at this objectively, the fact that the Liberal Party of the province could even contemplate doing this sort of free-for-all is an outrage to the people. Now, the Liberal Party says there just wasn't enough time to hold an AGM to change the rules, but this has come up before. Seven years ago, after he won, Dwight Ball said the rules should be changed. And I'll give the last word on this to the outgoing Premier when he was the brand new Liberal leader. Making a full disclosure on the political contributions is certainly clearly the, the only way to be truly open and transparent. All right, Dwight Ball a few years ago. So now the rules are out. Who do, who's in and who is out? Anthony, everyone's still, or there's lots of people at least, on the maybe list. Let's take a look at some of the names considering, because we do have a few new names. John Abbott, former Deputy Minister of Health. He's also been a healthcare consultant and was head of the Canadian Mental Health Association in this province. He's considering a run. And speaking of health, so is the current health minister, John Hagee. He says he still wants to study the rules. And a few names that we've mentioned before, we have Surgeon Andrew Fury, Businessman Paul Antle, and Cabinet Minister Byrne Davis, all still on the maybe list. And uh, now that the rules are out, they'll have some time to consider it. Yeah, not a lot of time though, right? Nope. Less, how many days? 11 days to 11 days. get the na your name and the money okay. into the party. Well, listen, good luck getting the 25 grand together. We'll miss you here. <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm busy enough uh, without trying to take Just on another job, out. Anthony. All right, Peter. That's uh, Peter Cowan live in our Here and Now studio. Well, Fisheries and Land Resources Minister Jerry Byrne says he's sorry for using the word savages on social media. Byrne was at a charity basketball game over the weekend when he got hit in the face. He left him bloodied and on Twitter, Byrne jokingly referred to his rivals as savages. An Indigenous media account called Mi'kmaq Matters called him on it, citing centuries of the word being used against Indigenous people. Byrne then responded saying Mi'kmaq Matters didn't have a sense of humor. But the next day, Byrne said that he's reflected on it and he's sorry for sending that tweet. But what I didn't reflect on is that it does have a, it does have a very serious historical connotation and a context. And given the fact that we all need to be leaders here, uh, despite the fact that I didn't take it within that context, it was in a very different context, I have to be more sensitive around that reality. Well, police in Ontario began removing blockades this morning, which have stopped rail traffic for nearly three weeks now. Ontario provincial police officers arrived on scene this morning and arrested protesters. The members of the Tyendigana Mohawk camp were put in handcuffs and loaded into police vehicles. Demonstrators had been warned to clear the rail tracks by midnight last night or face charges. The Mohawks defied that order, remaining at the protest site near Belleville. The demonstration is in support of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and their efforts to stop construction of a natural gas pipeline in northern BC. There, we are not in any way compromising our commitment to the reconciliation agenda, but at the same time, the impact of these rail disruptions um, and the barricades is, is untenable. It can't continue. It cannot persist. Um, it's, it's absolutely essential that those barricades come down and that rail service be resumed. Um, that is, is, is now the responsibility of, of the provincial jurisdiction and the police of those jurisdictions. Um, we remain committed to the reconciliation agenda, but, but you know, the one, the one is not contingent on the other. The barricades cannot persist. A little later on here and now, we'll bring you more details on today's police actions to remove the blockades. Meanwhile, youth activists gathered in Ottawa today. They've been drumming, dancing and raising their voices in an effort to get their message out. They're participating in what's called the All Eyes on Parliament Hill rally. Several hundred people are taking part in the event. It briefly closed a major intersection near Parliament Hill. Organizers say the event is in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en Nation. Demonstrators have traveled from around the Ottawa area as well as Toronto and Montreal. The sun is setting later and later. A beautiful afternoon today.
<laughs> yeah, beautiful afternoon today. You could see a little bit of a fog bank just offshore there uh, a little bit earlier, but uh, we did see some fog really across or for the south coast and then making its way towards Bonavista earlier today as well. Uh, if you take a look, not a whole lot happening. We're seeing some milder air as well. You know, the temperatures feeling very spring like as we were outside this afternoon. We are seeing some cloud cover and snow push through the big land tonight. That's going to continue uh, through the first half of tomorrow. And then we've got our next weather maker, uh, which will move in as we head towards the end of the week. Doesn't look super significant at this point, but uh, it is going to bring some snow with it. So I'll have all those details coming up. Just felt they were worth documenting before they, they disappear entirely. Preserving the Newfoundland root cellar. In half an hour, we'll introduce you to a Toronto photographer with an eye on rural root cellars on the island. Well, Philip Butler was found not guilty of both second degree murder and manslaughter in Supreme Court in St. John's over the weekend. He was charged in connection with the death of his older brother, George, in May of 2018. The jury deliberated all day Friday and shortly before noon Saturday, the verdict was handed down. And during the three-week trial, George Butler was described as someone with substance abuse issues, which made him paranoid and volatile. The defense claimed Philip Butler put his brother in a chokehold in self-defense. Well, the Canadian Cancer Society is pushing the provincial government to do more to stop young people from vaping. The society says it's now an epidemic. It just kind of started as like something that's cool and has become an epidemic at our school. The organization released a video today showing the prominence of vaping in schools. The Cancer Society wants the minimum age to buy cigarettes and e-cigarettes raised to 21. It also wants the sale of e-cigarettes restricted to places that only adults can go. The Cancer Society cites a report from the Institute of Medicine which says those steps would reduce smoking rates among 15 to 17 year olds by 25 percent. The latest government numbers show almost half of students from grades 7 to 12 have used vaporizers or e-cigarettes. Health Minister John Hagee says this is the second campaign this winter to warn people about the dangers of vaping. To Dempster a couple of weeks ago at an event here with the Alliance for the Control of Tobacco, at which she, her department launched uh, a video that they had funded to uh, um, try and educate youth, uh, parents and, and uh, youth mentors, coaches and people like that who would come into contact with youth about the uh, significant health hazards of vaping nicotine. It was very well received and I think there is a media campaign now out there to try and help address this. Uh, uh, obviously from our point of view it is a concern because uh, it threatens the health of future generations. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans released its findings from its annual northern shrimp assessment and it's a mixed bag. Shrimp fishing areas 4, 5 and 6 are classified as cautious, healthy and critical. At a technical briefing today, scientists from DFO outlined the levels of the northern shrimp stock, saying the three main zones are at or near their lowest levels since the mid-1990s. Well, the FFAW says the report isn't dire and says the DFO survey is incomplete. For the fourth straight year, shrimp fishing area six remains in the critical zone, having seen a decrease of 8% from last year. There's a lot of different factors at play, some of them we don't fully understand. We know that predation has been high on northern shrimp in recent, recent years, so you know some of the ground fish biomass has been going up, while shrimp has going, been going down, and then there's not as many capelin, or there hadn't been, so you know the ground fish are eating more shrimp than they used to. Three is now hanging from the rafters of Mile One Center. The St. John's Edge retired his number in a ceremony yesterday. His career spanned 25 years, and as the CBC's Jeremy Eaton explains, had a large impact on basketball in this province. First, I want to thank my beautiful wife. He's a good shooter, he's always good, and he had a good career. It was an amazing book. Why did you like it so much? Basically because his story is remarkable, his like story is amazing. I gotta thank my brothers. Um, try not to get emotional, but it's, like I said, to say this is surreal. 
when you go through what we went through at such a young age, you know, he really puts things into perspective for you. And my journey, my passion has always been basketball. And my four brothers, Peter, Bradley, Mike, and Kevin, have always been there and have my back for everything. It's emotional. Uh, it just means a lot for my family, uh, my brothers alongside of me. And also what Carol's done for basketball, Newfoundland and growing the product. Um, you know, as we talked earlier, my little boy is six years old and he's playing basketball because of Carol. Everything's Uncle Carol. But where you, you look at the stadium here today, the place is full, coming out to support Carol. And I don't think it's about today, it's about the last 25 years and what he's done for Newfoundland and the small little poor communities in basketball. And it's about believing in yourself. And if you want to do something, put your mind to it and go for it. I think it was really cool how we got, like, from such a small town, got to go over the world to play basketball. Really cool. I, I knew you guys followed me, and I, I knew I had a lot of fans, but I didn't realize how special it was when I came back home. And you love your I think you've done a lot for couple years, this place was packed. Make some noise! What I remember from him, and when I'm long past, past St. John's would be how great the guy was off the floor. Um, as a family man, as a dad, as a husband, uh, there, was, there was nobody better. And, and I know that I will you know, take everything that you've taught me uh, the rest of my life. So I just want to congratulate you on your special day. You know, on your special day. You deserve this all my life. We had like Tim Beckett, and Tim Beckett was the first guy who made Division One. Then we had Carl, and then Carl was a star in Division One. And then we had Janine Brown, same town as Carl, and I think people in Newfoundland started to see that there was a possibility they could do that too. So the biggest impact I think that he had on basketball in Newfoundland was the fact that people could see themselves achieving what he did. walk in solidarity with those who are hungry, hurting, and homeless in our community. Hundreds of people took to the St. John's streets for the annual coldest night of the year fundraiser.
Okay, well, no doubt you've had somebody complain about the snow, if you know, because people tend to get a little crabby. But with mm -hmm. all that cold and all that snow, some people really happy are the snowmobilers in central Newfoundland. Right? Yeah, riders are coming from far and wide to take advantage. So here now, Garrett Berry will explain. It's what a rider dreams of. Beautiful, sunshine, a little bit, not too cold. It's nice. Right. And a lot of snow on the ground. And a lot of snow on the ground. Call it white gold. This powdery snow, it seems like everyone's traveling to get a piece. All well, the trails down here are a lot better than up home, and we don't get much snow up there. We get a lot more snow down here. We've been coming out, we, this is three weekends now, so we uh, came out to Port Blanford a few times, and this one we've been looking forward to for a long time. They're even celebrating in St. John's, a relief after last year. Uh, you only got to drive a couple of minutes uh, out on Cochrane Pond Road and uh, drop off your machine and you can go for, for days. The secret of these trails are the warm-up shacks, where everyone gets together. You get a break from out in the cold and you win and everyone's gathering around the wood stove and uh, just, you know, shooting the breeze and, and uh, having a laugh and, you know, sharing a few snacks and whatever. All these machines are worth thousands and thousands. A new snowmobile will run you about $15,000, and good snow means good business. If we have a snowstorm, we uh, a half a day for some people to get dug out and cleaned up, and uh, then we'll usually see them coming in, you know, looking for the snowblower or, you know, parts for their snowmobile or a new snowmobile, hopefully. Almost 250 centimeters since December 1st. That's a lot of snowfalls. That's a lot of sales. You could see probably a 15% increase um, so far in, in the winter season, which is a small part of our business, but uh, still good to see. Um, the last couple seasons have not been quite as good, so it's, uh, it's nice to have that once in a while. The sticker shock is a little easier to manage on days like these. It makes it worth having them. Other years you say, oh, all that money, uh, yeah. not really getting to use it. No, this year's been fantastic. If you take a look at what they find, you'll start to understand why they come out again and again. Garrett Perry, CBC News, Gander. Um, did it feel like spring today? Like that, I think the so. The sun was incredible. Everybody I saw on Twitter was funny. It was like, all is forgiven. Newfoundland and oh, Labrador yeah, so that's weather. A typical thing. Well, let's see what happens <laughs> between now and April. But even going by yes. Memorial University, coming to CBC, there are people, there are some young students, and it really looks as though, wow, it's like the month of May. People without their jackets on. It's true. It's yeah. funny, though, because if we were seeing these, I mean, we only reached a high near one degree in St. Well, John's. was it? Yeah, but if it was one degree in October, we'd all be in a parka. Yeah. But because it's been so cold. It did feel like it was 10. It was lovely. Mentally. Oh, and the sun is back, which yeah. is what feels there so go. good. Yeah, Anyhow, absolutely. So thank you. You're welcome. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at the temperatures across the province, though. So, uh, it was warm. The warm spot was 7 degrees in Corner Brook earlier today. So it certainly felt like spring there. We can thank a southerly flow for that. And then mild, relatively mild up through Labrador, minus 8 in Lab City. It was the afternoon high today, minus 9 in Cartwright, and then Nain still in those minus double digits around minus 16. So temperatures have dropped a little bit. We're uh, down to about minus 2 in St. John's now, 2 degrees in Corner Brook, and then those temperatures into the minus teens uh, for Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Lab City. You're still sitting at minus 8. That will actually uh, continue to see that temperature rise as we head towards the morning hours, and that's because the next system is rolling in. We're seeing some cloud cover uh, and some uh, snow already. That'll continue to spread across the uh, big land as we head through the overnight tonight. And then the next uh, little disturbance will move in. Mainly it's going to affect the southern portion of the island as well as the Avalon. So we could see some flurries or freezing drizzle at some point overnight tonight. And then again, that snow will spread towards uh, coastal Labrador. Generally less than five centimeters. Lab West, you're going to pick up somewhere between five to ten. So another couple of centimeters from what fell earlier today. And then other than that, we should see things taper off by the time we get to the early morning hours through the uh, early morning hours. So here's where we're going to be sitting tonight. Uh, your temperature for Lab City climbing now, but it's going to drop again down to minus 13, minus nine for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then temperatures down into those minus single digits. The winds will stay relatively light as we head through the overnight as well. And uh, the winds will ease along the coast as we uh, start to see that snow move in. Now tomorrow afternoon, 
looks nice again. We'll probably see uh, a few flurries in the first half of the day along the uh, northern peninsula. Otherwise, some sunshine through the afternoon, which will be nice again with those temperatures staying quite warm through the day. We'll see some lingering flurry activity for the lab west. Otherwise, it looks like a nice day for you as well. So pretty quiet. Then we'll see some cloud cover move in. And that's ahead of the next system that will move in uh, pretty much overnight Tuesday into Wednesday. So we could see some flurries with that. Here's where you'll be sitting temperature wise, three, four degrees for the majority of us. Uh, Southwesterly is 10 to 15 kilometers per hour, three degrees for Marystown. You'll more than likely stay cloudy through the day. We could see some coastal fog again, especially along the south coast. The winds are shifting a little bit, so we're going from southerlies to southwesterlies. Uh, temperatures through central, plenty of sunshine. It looks like five degrees for Gander. Some lingering flurries possible up through Twillingate, Terra Nova as well, sitting around three degrees. As we head towards the coast, not quite as warm. And again, it's probably going to be uh, because of that wind shift southwesterly. So a little bit of an onshore flow versus that southerly flow today. So four degrees for you for Corner Brook. Some sunshine uh, possible. And then uh, some flurries for the Northern Peninsula, minus one for St. Anthony, minus five for Cartwright. And then we're going to see uh, temperatures mild again tomorrow for Happy Valley Goose Bay. But again, those lingering flurries, coastal areas, you might see some sunshine through the day. So that's a look at your forecast for tomorrow. We'll look ahead at the next weather maker coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, about 200 people walked the streets of St. John's over the weekend for a fundraiser called the coldest night of the year. It's a national event to raise money for local organizations that help people who are homeless and hungry. So this is the coldest night of the year event. It's a family friendly walking event uh, that takes people down through the downtown St. John's and it's all to uh, raise money for choices for youth at our outreach center and to walk in solidarity with those who are hungry, hurting and homeless in our community. This is a, a national event actually it takes place in about 150 communities across Canada and this is Choices for Youth's seventh coldest night of the year event and to date it's raised about $250,000 for Choices for Youth. This year our goal is to raise $45,000 and just a few minutes ago I checked and we're almost there. We're at over $44,000 so I think we're going to hit our goal today. Two. I think it's really easy for youth, especially in our province, to fall through the cracks. So it's really important to support organizations like Choices that are kind of there to help them when they need it. Just last year we served over 1,600 young people, which is an incredible amount when you think about the population of our province. So every dollar raised stays right here in our community to help young people who are struggling, who need a little bit of support, um, and who just, you know, want to make things better for themselves, which is pretty incredible. The pressures today are so intense for young people that, you know, we almost can't even imagine some of the things that they're going through. So we need to make sure that the supports are in place and all that comes from supporting choices and supporting awesome events like this. Northern Italy is Europe's biggest hotspot for the coronavirus, with roadblocks set up to lock down several towns.
a disturbing story now for anybody who's caring for somebody elderly. Two families and several former staff have filed complaints against a nursing home that's run by a major chain. And they allege residents didn't receive proper care and hygiene practices caused them some harm, including keeping residents in dirty diapers. Erica Johnson has this go public investigation. Don Bryan says he's still haunted by how his mother suffered as a resident at this nursing home for four years. Sheila Bryan developed repeated bladder and yeast infections, was in so much discomfort, says her son, she scratched her skin raw. It was frustrating and, and angry. Like, I, I, you know, to stand there and to watch. Hmm. He blames poor hygiene practices, says his mother was often left in wet diapers. He's one of five people who filed complaints against two senior staff at Extendicare Athabasca, claiming practices at the for-profit nursing home came at the expense of quality care. A complaint filed by a former nurse describes how diapers were rationed, locked away so health care aides had difficulty accessing extra when needed. In an email obtained by GoPublic, the director of care tells staff she's changing the access code to the room storing the diapers. The new code is not to be shared with health care aid, she writes, because product removal was being abused. That's absolutely ridiculous. You know, how can you ration someone when they go to the washroom? You have no control over that. The complaint says diaper wipes were rationed too, one per change, and washing the groin area with soap and water discouraged. Statistics show that during that period, the nursing home had a urinary tract infection rate of 7.5%, much higher than the national average. A healthcare advocacy organization says standards of care vary from province to province. So this is again why we're calling for some national standards that uh, would apply to all long-term care facilities across the country so that residents know that they could be relying um, on these facilities to treat them with dignity and respect. Don Bryan says he's waiting for a decision on the complaint he filed, hoping for some kind of justice, he says, for his mother. Extendicare declined an interview request and said it disagreed with many of the allegations. It also said diapers were locked away, but briefly due to a personnel issue. And it said the home passed its most recent government audit. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, back to a story being watched closely across the country. Mohawks in eastern Ontario have been blocking a main rail corridor through eastern Ontario for almost three weeks now. But today, police took action. Officers arrived at the protest site to enforce a court injunction and to clear the tracks, but it didn't go as peacefully as had been hoped. The CBC's Olivia Stefanovic has been at the scene all day. It took just moments for dozens of police officers to move in on the Mohawk camp. Reporters were held back while brief scuffles took place. This cell phone video taken by a Mohawk media network shows what was perhaps the most heated parts of the confrontation. Several demonstrators were arrested, and even in the back of a police truck, they remained defiant. Hours later, with police still on scene, their snowplow, the centerpiece of this Mohawk protest, was hauled away by police after 19 days facing the rails. The protest has been in support of what Soden hereditary chiefs in B.C. fighting a natural gas pipeline on their territory. They are insisting police leave their land. Until their demands are met, remaining Mohawks here say they won't leave either. It's going to stay here for as long as it takes for the RCMP to get out. It's time for Canada to know what it's like to be invaded. This demonstrator says Canada's relationship with Indigenous people is at stake. Reconciliation doesn't come at the end of a gun. You can't give us an ultimatum to leave somewhere that we've been for hundreds of years, that we were given as a gift by the Queen. While the raid unfolded on Parliament Hill, the concern was about the economic impact of the blockade. Over the past number of days, we've been working with rail carriers to ensure uh, that many trains continue to use alternate routes uh, to get through, and that's one of the reasons we've been able to avoid some of the most serious, uh, serious shortages. For the opposition, Today's police action came too late. I believe that it shouldn't take 19 days uh, sh 
shortages for propane, 1,500 people losing their job, countless of small businesses uh, losing out, laying people off, uh, cutting back in hours to have the law applied in this country. As the police operation continues, protests flared up in other parts of the country, and demonstrators here say even though parts of the camp are coming down, this could be far from over. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Tyne Denega, Ontario. I just felt they were worth documenting before they, they disappear entirely. From rural Newfoundland to the big smoke, a photographer has an exhibit of root cellars on display in Toronto. Richard Johnson came to Newfoundland, took more than 100 pictures of different root cellars. We'll have a chat with the photographer bringing the dying root cellar back to life for a mainland audience. Root cellars, especially the ones that you see in rural Newfoundland, are a part of the living history of our province. Richard Johnson is a Toronto-based photographer who located and shot more than 100 root cellars located between Twillingate and Elliston, and we've reached him in Toronto. Hello, Richard. Hi, Anthony. So why root cellars? Well, it's a continuation of my interest for small hand-built structures. Um, I've been 10 years photographing the architecture of ice fishing across Canada. Root cellars seemed like a natural extension to that, small hand-built structures with a, a bit of a food narrative to it, um, certainly abandoned, many of them. Um, I just felt they were worth documenting before they, they disappear entirely. So a, a devil's advocate question for you, uh, Richard. If you've seen one root cellar, haven't you seen them all? Well, they are very similar, and they sit into the landscape in a similar manner. But, um, you know, everything's, everything's got its own little personal recipe to it when these people put things together, hand-built, uh, and, and each, each one is, is a little bit different. These, these sort of structures that would normally be built underground, but because of the rocky terrain, they're built on top of the ground and then right. bermed up and covered for the ins insulation. There were about 80% of them abandoned, which is, uh, like you can see behind me, just the empty holes in the landscape. Um, there was about 20% that still had the doors on them. And of that 20%, 10 were still used as root cellars, okay. active root cellars. And the other 10 with doors were sort of garden sheds, uh, you know, bicycles, lawnmowers and things. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised that some people are still using them? Well, absolutely, um, because, uh, 
And, you know, the people that do use them, they keep them up in good shape. And uh, they don't need, you know, much. I mean, it's a very natural, you know, ventilation flow. And it's a very simple structure in terms of how they work. You debuted this last month, right? How did the, how did the exhibit go? How did root sellers go over? Well, it was, it was well, well received, actually. Um, everyone's interested in the topic. And again, photography for me is about bringing uh, a topic, you know, forward. And, and I, I think a lot of people who came to the show uh, have, had, had never heard about them um, and learned about them for the first time. And, and so that's, that's a wonderful thing to be able to share uh, a little slice of Canadiana mm -hmm. uh, and, and something that's a little quirky and a little off the grid and, you know, bring that to people's consciousness. You featured chip wagons, uh, garbage bins, ice huts. How do you go about choosing the objects for your photography? Well, you know, the hand-built structures is what intrigues me. Um, I think I like, I like very much that uh, the narrative of, of food, somehow food sort of has a, tr a trend through it. But I don't know. I mean, I, you know, when I go through a landscape, I look at, at similar, similar items. Uh, what stands out for me, having, having seen sort of a landscape for the first time. Um, you know, I didn't do a lot of research. Uh, I just sort of show up and, and things kind of fall into place. And see where they go. Uh, yeah, that's the, you know, the way I work best. I, I mean, I think if you over plan something, you know, there's just too many variables. There's the, there's the weather, there's the time of year, there's, there's the access. Um, there's, you know, will there be anything there to shoot in the first place? All right, Richard. Well, I know a lot of people watching tonight, uh, that there's a certain fondness for these Tolkien-like structures that are across the island. Uh, thanks a lot for telling us about your exhibit. Uh, thanks for asking. It's been a now, if you're going to be in Toronto before now and the end of April, you can actually check out this exhibit for yourself. It's on display at the Richard Johnson Gallery on the Esplanade in Toronto. Well, now back to our top story. Some significant developments today in the spread of the coronavirus, now known as COVID-19. We're learning about two more cases in Canada, a woman in Toronto and a man in British Columbia. The woman arrived in Toronto from China on Friday, and she is now in self-isolation at home after initially seeking treatment for a cough. Officials say her illness is mild and consider the risk to others as low. They say she wore a mask on her flight and had limited contact with other individuals, but they are contacting other passengers who sat near her on her flight as a precaution. This would be Ontario's fourth case of COVID-19. The other patients have all recovered. And while China has the largest number of coronavirus cases and more than 2,500 deaths, it's now reporting a slight reduction in new cases. But a jump in infections in other countries over the weekend is causing fresh worries. And health officials in Europe are scrambling to limit the spread after Italy reported more than 200 cases. The CBC's Renee Filipponi reports. Police blocked the way in and out of nearly a dozen towns across northern Italy. This is the first major outbreak in Europe, and the lockdown is an attempt to stop it from spreading. This officer says they are following instructions, blocking roads and asking people not to leave their homes. Behind the barricades are mostly empty streets. Fear is keeping many inside. Some venture out, only to line up for masks, which are limited in supply. The concern goes beyond Italy's borders. A train was stopped traveling to Austria because two passengers had a fever. It turned out not to be the coronavirus. Austria's chancellor says they are expanding checks at airports and borders and will stop trains if needed. The World Health Organization has sent a team to Italy. This is about good risk management. It's about good communication between states. It's about management and early detection of cases and their appropriate isolation and treatment. Uh, it's not about shutting borders. It's very difficult to understand exactly how and why these infections spread. This expert says it's unclear why Italy has seen this outbreak, adding there is no clear evidence yet community-wide lockdowns are the solution. We know it transmits face-to-face, -face social contact, a cough, a sneeze, and we know that it also transmits in hospital settings. But we just don't know what it does in the community.
The risk has driven authorities to cut short events like the Venice Carnival and close major tourist venues across the region. There is too much alarmism, this man says, which is not always justified. But the fear is real in cities like Milan. Grocery store shelves are near empty as residents stock up in case the virus spreads and more lockdowns are ordered. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. All right, so you mentioned seven degrees in Cornerbrook today. Kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at least some snow melting on the west coast. A bit of snow melting on the Avalon. It too, was like melting sun. here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that sun angle. We're getting closer and closer to daylight savings, mm -hmm. which means seven o'clock. That's right. Big smile. Seven um, o'clock. So as we start to look towards the middle of the week. How are things looking? Is it going to stick around like? Well, it was looking quiet this weekend, really. It looked like the whole week was going to be quiet, but things changed today, unfortunately. As yes, as they do. So we'll take a look at uh, the forecast for Wednesday. It's not that bad, but we are going to see some flurries move in overnight Tuesday into Wednesday morning, and that will be along the northern peninsula. And then keep an eye on that low pressure system there. It's gonna, what we call a compact low. It just means it's tiny. Uh, it's going to move through at this point. It looks like overnight Wednesday or overnight Tuesday into Wednesday morning. So we could see a quick couple of centimeters with that. It's going to move off uh, fairly quickly through the afternoon. But again, those flurries will make their way towards central as well. And then this area of high pressure is going to dominate for a little bit up through Labrador and stick around uh, into the beginning of Thursday. It's going to extend down through parts of the island as well. So it does look like we should see some sunshine with that. So here's where we're going to be sitting temperature wise. Little bit of a drop still sitting above zero though for most of us. Uh, five degrees through Marystown. Best chance of seeing some showers there or rather sunshine there. And then again, once those flurries move through in the first half of Wednesday, we should see some sunshine uh, for the rest of eastern Newfoundland as well. Uh, flurries the story for Cornerbrook one degree minus 16 for Lab City. So we're going to start to get into some of that colder air, but sunshine with that as well. Minus 11 for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Nain. You're sitting around minus 19 through the day on Wednesday. 
Now that high will dominate. We could see a few flurries overnight into Thursday and then the next weather maker moves in. So we'll start to see some cloud cover push through Thursday afternoon and the winds will pick up as well. And as this system moves, it doesn't look super significant at this point. Uh, as far as amounts go, it's too soon to tell, but we could see some accumulation certainly with this. Uh, mainly for the uh, island up through Labrador, you'll see some flurries as well. Not nearly as much snow, maybe along the southeastern portion of uh, the big land. But other than that, uh, not too much in the way of snow. So this high area of high pressure kind of lingers around for a little while. It's going to move back down. And before that, though, you're going to see some flurry activity. So it does look generally unsettled uh, for the remainder of the weekend. Not nearly as nice as it was this weekend, but temperatures will be a little cooler as well. So here's where we'll be sitting by um, Thursday. Temperature dipping to minus six, and then we'll see a little bit of a warm up again, hovering around the zero degree mark for Friday and Saturday with that uh, grace, generally gray skies and the potential for some flurries sticking around. Now for central Newfoundland, pretty much the same roller coaster. Uh, temperatures around minus six by Thursday and then back up again by Friday above zero it should be. And then by Saturday we're looking at flurries and minus two. For uh, western Newfoundland, after some sunshine tomorrow, maybe a few peaks of sun on Thursday as well. And then Saturday you're looking at uh, minus three and the potential for some flurry. So the temperatures do look like they'll uh, sit a little bit below seasonal again. For uh, Eastern Labrador, temperatures are actually going to warm up for you though by Friday and Saturday. So we're looking at uh, mid minus single digits with the potential for some flurries. And then we're looking at Western Labrador uh, as that ridge of high pressure dominates. Best chance of seeing that sunshine, but those colder temperatures again rebounding a little bit for both Friday and Saturday with that potential for some flurry. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, the massive Frontier oil sands project in northern Alberta has been shelved. Tech Resources has informed the federal government that it's withdrawing its application for the mine. The company says it's walking away from the $20 billion project due to the political debate about climate policy. The federal cabinet was scheduled to announce its decision on approval for Frontier in the next few days. The cabinet will no longer be making that decision. The project would have generated thousands of jobs, but it would have also created about 4 million tons of greenhouse gases every year. Tech is going to take a $1.13 billion write down on this project. The jury in the Harvey Weinstein trial in New York handed down its verdict today. Harvey Weinstein has finally been held accountable for crimes he committed. Weinstein was found guilty of rape in the third degree and a criminal sexual act in the first degree, but he was found not guilty on two counts of predatory sexual assault. Those charges were an attempt by prosecutors to prove that the former movie producer had a pattern of abusive behavior. The 67-year-old was taken into custody immediately after the verdict. Sentencing is next month. Lawyers for Weinstein say they will appeal. It was a beautiful weekend for getting out and exploring and take a look at this beauty shot. Bit of a skidoo theme on uh, here and on now tonight. On show tonight, <laughs> there definitely is, but that bluebird sky. Nice. I just love it so much. All right, I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
All right, something sad that was marked today. Basketball giant Kobe Bryant was honored at a public memorial service in Los Angeles. The NBA superstar, his daughter, and seven others died in a terrible helicopter crash last month. We love and miss you, Boo Boo and Gigi. May you both rest in peace and have fun in heaven until we meet again one day. Thousands of fans, celebrities, and athletes attended the packed ceremony that started with a performance by Beyonce. The 41-year-old retired Los Angeles Lakers star is considered one of the greatest players in National Basketball League history. Yeah, on January 26, Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter were headed to a basketball tournament she was supposed to play in, uh, and the helicopter crashed just northwest of Los Angeles. Yeah, it's horribly sad. Mm, it is. Yeah. Okay, well, it's uh, the end of the show, so let's go back to the uh, photo. The weather photo or viewer photo of the day. Did you get out and enjoy the weekend? A uh, little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, was, this was taken in Mount Payton. Yeah, so that was a beautiful view of central Newfoundland. Great perspective. Bird's eye view in that beautiful blue sky. Thank you uh, to Chris Tuck for sharing that with us today. Great shot. Huh? Great shot, yeah. Visibility. I know, stunning. See, see forever. You could. Nice shot, Chris, thank you very much. Yes, and if you have any photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Mm -hmm. All right, so everyone enjoyed a nice, pretty nice day today. Mm -hmm. It was good, right? It feels like maybe winter's Spring. not going to last forever. It's definitely not, right, we so all know that. There was that. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot for watching this evening, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Good night.